Please consider becoming a patron of Myth Vision Podcast. You'll get early access to every video, including this amazing one. And you can ask me personal questions, private message me, anything you'd like. Professor Elaine Pagels, I'm skipping ahead on some of my questions because when we talk, it flows, the conversation flows, and we have no choice but to discuss what's pertinent, what's relevant in our mind at the time. And the suffering of Christ must be literally true to Orthodox believers. Do you think these persecutions and martyrdom of these saints are myths to back up their theology of Christ? For example... Professor Candida Maas comes to mind. Also, it seems Gnostics didn't care for persecution or martyrdom while Orthodox Christians were applying their understanding to Christ's martyrdom. Not all Gnostics, you say. You, you, I wrote this question as I was reading your book and then get to the part where you're like, no, not some Gnostics were about martyrdom and persecution and they yeah. were part of that. But not all uh, Gnostics seem to be anti-martyrdom. Martyrdom purchases eternal life that's one of the questions I had. And did persecution of Orthodox Christian cause their posi- position to become more popular? More like, this is the true faith because we're being persecuted like our Lord, like P- Peter, like yeah. James, like Paul. So that helped validate the truth of their claims in some sense. Mm-hmm. There are lots of questions about persecution. And, you know, originally people pictured that it was universal, that it was every Christian was in immediate danger of of being arrested and tortured. That's overdone. But recently, someone like Professor Moss has has simply said, oh, well, it's just a myth. Um, There were very few people who actually got killed and tortured compared to the number of Christians there were. And and they basically build themselves up as victims in some way. What I think she, she misses here is the fact that you don't have to kill a lot of people to terrify a whole population. That's what crucifixion was for. The Romans crucified Jesus and others. It was public. It was like a billboard, as Paula Fredrickson said. Like, don't become a revolutionary. This could happen to you. So Jesus' crucifixion, like that of many others, thousands of other Jews, was to tell the rest of them, don't try it. And that still works. You don't have to crucify and torture, kill a lot of people. But Christians were persecuted actively. What I understood about Candida Moss's work, she was writing at Notre Dame. She was not liking hearing a lot of Protestants talk as if they were persecuted when they're actually affluent, well-off members of Christian communities seeing themselves as persecuted with a kind of persecution complex. Mm -hmm. And she was challenging that point of view with contemporary Christians that she was attacking. And that's what she was writing the book about, really. She's now come much more upfront with it, and she's deliberately writing challenging certain kinds of Protestant views, which I think is much better than trying to pretend that that's the way it was in the early church. But the the death of Jesus, some people, some people said, well, who was the Christ anyway? Was Christ, do we mean the spirit inside of Jesus? If we mean the spirit inside of Jesus, well, the spirit can't be tortured. The spirit is, is not the body. The body was tortured, the spirit was not. So some people made that distinction. Most Christians did not, whether they were called Gnostic or Orthodox. They understood Jesus' crucifixion was a horrifying event. There's no worse and more terrible, shameful, agonizing death than crucifixion in the Roman Empire. It was a powerful statement. And the idea that a crucified man who ended his life as a complete failure in any human terms, 
would suddenly then have his followers say, we saw him. He came back. The worst thing happened to him. And he wasn't defeated. God has vindicated him. We believe in him. This, this was a huge vindication. So I don't think it's what inspired other people to seek martyrdom. But when they were arrested and tortured, those who didn't give in did feel they were imitating the passion of Christ and that doing that, and they still do, you know. There's still Christians who are crucified and shot to death and beheaded by people who hate Christians in parts of this world and in parts of Africa and Egypt. Uh, this is going on today. It's happened in, also in Asia, uh, in parts of Asia and China. So martyrdom of Christians is, is not over. Um, and it is the way that many realize that they, they may have to um, confess their faith. So it's, it's always been part of Christian tradition. So in a sense, I guess in light of the question that I, I rose about persecution and martyrdom validating that we're on the right path too, it's almost like an assurance of saying it became more like you could purchase your salvation through this. It's like you legitimately are, it, you know, the Muslims have something similar, some forms of it. Yes, say, yes. Jihad, you know, if I die yes. for this, I'm automatically going to heaven, 72 virgins, depending on, you know. Well, certain leaders, certain bishops, too, encourage people not to give in. If you're arrested, don't give in. You have to confess Christ, because otherwise he will deny you in heaven. So, so yes, martyrdom was encouraged, and other Christians were troubled that their that young people were encouraged to martyr themselves because it was a way to get to heaven. Although, and, and they said, well, this is the quickest route. <laughs> it was a, a way, just, just like the jihadists say, you know, if, if you or your son or daughter dies as a martyr, they immediately go to heaven and they have special rewards. That's part of Christian teaching too. Mm -hmm. um, so, I want to get back to what you're saying. Just the, oh, and, and yes, and, and people like Tertullian, who saw people he knew um, tortured in the public sports arena, dying in horrible ways, entertaining the crowd. He, he, said, he said, he watched that and he thought, how can those people do that? How do they dare go to their deaths with that courage? He said, this... The more you kill us, the more we multiply. The blood of Christians is seed. And Justin Martyr, another uh, man, Greek philosopher, coming from a pagan family, watched people being tortured in the arena in the Colosseum in Rome about the year 150. And he said, I've seen criminals die in the arena. They scream, they plead for their lives, they are desperate. These people are courageous. They go to their death with a kind of courage that is like Socrates. I mean, they're like philosophers, but they're just ordinary people. They're not even educated. How do they do that? And Justin said he, like Tertullian, watching such things, became a Christian, which is totally contrary to what the Romans had in mind. Mm -hmm. but, it, but he also said... That's how he became a Christian, because he felt there was power in these people that was inexplicable if it didn't come from a divine source. So that's what they meant when they said, when Tertullian said, the blood of Christians is seed for the church. The more you kill us, the more we multiply. And for Gnostics that are anti-martyrdom, or it seemed like some of them were not fans of doing that at all, did that help these Orthodox guys kind of go, you're definitely not true Christians if you're not seeing that this is... I mean, it's like it's like the New Testament. They're, Jesus is using the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible as his source, right? So now you've got Christians three, four, five centuries after Christ 
And here they are seeing in their own scriptures, by this time they're looking at their own apostles and their own prophets, and they're going, hey, they're dying. Like, we must be doing something, not saying they're encouraging, like, go die tomorrow. No, but my point is, is it's validating the suffering servant concepts that we see in Christ. It's validating exactly what happened to Paul, Peter, James. And these Gnostics aren't doing that on a... It doesn't seem like that's happening to them. So... Obviously, they're not authentic, or this can't be the true faith, or something like that. Do you think that played a part? I think, you know, if if Christians today had to consider that if if we decide to meet and worship Jesus today at in somebody's house, we could get a knock on the door. the The military could come and arrest us and torture anybody who who said that he or she was a Christian, and then kill us we'd have an argument. Some people would say, you've got to do it. You've got to stand up. That's what makes you a Christian. You've got to follow Jesus through the passion, through the crucifixion, through the death. And others would say, no, if you can, if you can get out of the city, if you can go where the police can't find you, do that. Because Jesus said, you know, flee into the hills. Yeah. He also said, take up your cross and follow me. So it just depends on what you... There are contrary sayings, exactly as you say, Derek, in the in the Bible, in Do the you New think Testament. Those are interpolations, possibly. I mean, taking a scene in the second century and they're going. I don't know. Hmm. I mean, I do think that "take up your cross and follow me" might have come later, because I'm not sure that many of them realized how Jesus would die right. until it actually happened. It was too shocking. Right. But although he may have predicted it. But I think there there were so many sides taken. And one thing that they would always challenge people they called heretics by saying, well, you just don't have the conviction. You you just give up. You just say, oh, uh, no, no, I guess I'm not a Christian now. So it's one of the most painful questions, most terrible questions that any person would have to consider uh, if that faith was being... Um, attacked by the state. Thank you.